All right, everybody, we are going to get started. So um, welcome to our second installment of this quarter's Friend Fellowship talk discussion series. Um, my name is Renee Fox. For those of you who don't know me, I am the co-director of the Dickens Project and the, um, uh, I think we're calling me the inaugural Friends Fellow, but really I'm just the guinea pig Friends Fellow as we try to figure out what this, um, what this program is going to look like. Um, I see Grace Moore, who is here, is going to be our Winter Quarter Friends Fellow, um, Grace Wave. Um, so, <laughs> so we can look forward to, to hearing from her and talking about Trollope as we approach next quarter. I'm so glad to see you here. Um, so the, the last talk I gave in October was basically me talking the whole time, as I told you, about my book project and, um, and, um, and introduce you to the kinds of, of work that I've been doing and my, my own interests. Um, today and the, uh, the meeting that we're gonna have in December are totally not gonna be about me talking. This is gonna be about us all um, discussing Dracula. Today, we're gonna be talking about chapters one to 16 of Dracula. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you folks have been thinking as you've been reading. Um, I've been talking to a couple of my friends and colleagues who are here as they've been reading and we've been having a really fun time um, discussing it. Um, so I thought before we, before we get into the actual discussion um, that it might be helpful if I did two things for you. So the first is to just give you a little biographical sketch of Bram Stoker. Um, this is a novelist um, with whom you may or may not be familiar, even though I would imagine that um, everyone in this room has some familiarity with Dracula in some form or another. Um, but so I'm going to talk about, about Stoker a little bit, um, and then I want us to look at some postage stamps that were um, that were issued in Ireland in 2012 to um, to celebrate the hundredth anniversary of Stoker's death, and use those to get us into a conversation about Dracula. Um, just because mostly I think that they're cool, and I think that it's always handy to. Um, to have a thing to look at before we start. Um, so my sense of how the conversation will go is that um, anytime you want to say something, um, just say it, and we'll see if that free-for-all works. And if the free-for-all doesn't work, <laughs> then I might start asking folks to, to raise your hands um, so that we can, we can make sure that everybody has a chance to contribute. So Bram Stoker. Um, he was born in 1847 in Dublin, um, sort of in like a, a suburb of North Dublin. His father was a middle-class Irish Protestant. He, um, he worked in Dublin Castle. He was a clerk of some sort. Um, Stoker's mother was a woman named Charlotte. She was actually not from Dublin. She was not a middle-class Protestant. She was from County Sligo, which is in the Northwest of Ireland. Um, I don't know if, if many of you have spent time in Ireland, but you know, Dublin is like, you know, the, the urban city center of Ireland. And once you start going up to the north and the west, you start getting into the, the realm of the Irish fairies. So County Sligo is also where the poet W.B. Yeats's family is from. Um, it's where Yeats went home to whenever he felt like he needed to be more deeply connected to the Irish soil and the Irish legends and the Celtic heritage um, that he only really sort of was attached to. Um, but so that's where Stoker's mother was from. She was from the, the world of the Irish fairies. Um, and she moved to, to Dublin um, when she was an adult and married Bram Stoker's father. Um, Stoker himself, you know, grew up kind of between these two parents. So on the one hand, this father who was a pretty, you know, classical middle-class petty clerk and his mother who loved nothing more than telling stories about um, Irish legends and, you know, uh, telling Stoker stories from the Arabian Nights, she, she sort of loved the world of, of legends and the supernatural and mystery. And Stoker, um, for reasons that nobody can quite figure out, was bedridden until he was seven. He had some kind of mysterious, um, myster mysterious disease that made him unable to walk. And so he spent his first seven years basically in bed while his mother told him stories. Um, and that's a really important part of Stoker's Irish heritage that a lot of people don't know about and don't talk about. Um, it's not just that Stoker, you know, was born in Ireland, was raised in Ireland, was part of the, the kind of urban middle-class Protestant world of Ireland, but also that he had this upbringing that was also very, very steeped in Irish legend and Irish fairies and the, um, 
a kind of exotic, exotic Celticness of his mother's of his mother's family. Um, so for reasons, again, that are unknown, after he turned seven, he was fine. And he grew up to be this really intense athlete. He was a swimmer. Um, he went off to Trinity College, where he, um, he got lots of awards as a university athlete. He was also um, the president of the University Philosophical Society, president of the University Historical Society, so both an athlete and an intellect. Um, he worked after college as a petty clerk in Dublin, so he, he followed his father's footsteps and went to work in Dublin Castle. He ended up writing a manual about how to be a petty clerk in Dublin, which could possibly be the most boring thing that anybody has ever written ever about anything. Um, but while he was working as a petty clerk in, in Dublin Castle, he was also writing short stories. He was working for the Dublin Evening Mail as their theater critic. Um, and that's important for a couple of reasons. One, because it was Stoker's real first introduction into what became a, a lifelong love of theater. And also because the person who was the editor of the Dublin Even Evening Standard when, um, when Stoker was working for it was a man named Jay Sheridan Lefanu, who um, I don't I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He was a very very well known Irish Gothic writer from basically from the the eighteen forties all the way through the eighteen seventies. Um, he wrote a novella called Carmilla, which um, he published in the eighteen seventies, which is just an amazing lesbian vampire novella. Completely crazy, a wonderful book. If if you folks haven't read it. Um, Probably his most famous Irish Gothic novel is called Uncle Silas. It's a novel he wrote in 1864. Um, it's a kind of bizarre, crazy Irish big house Gothic novel about terrifying uncles and evil governesses and people getting stabbed and kidnapped and all sorts of terrible things happening. Also a very fun novel, if any of you get a chance. Um, but so Lifanu was writing all of these novels while Stoker was working for him at the Dublin Evening Standard. Um, and so... So while Stoker was working as the theater critic and writing his own short stories, he was also part of this world of Le Fanu and the world of Irish Gothic fiction. Um, he socialized with Le Fanu. Le Fanu lived in the same square in Dublin called Marion Square that the Wilde family lived in. Um, so Stoker also um, knew the Wildes. He, um, Oscar Wilde followed him to Trinity a couple of years after Stoker went. Um, and Stoker helped him get into the University Philosophical Society. Stoker used to, to go to the Wild salons and like sit and listen to William Wilde talking about his trips to Egypt and watch, um, Sto watch Wilde's mother, a crazy poet named Lady, Lady Jane. Um, her pen name was Speranza, and she wrote these like amazing nationalist poems that were published in the beginning of the 19th century. She like got, she was put on trial for, for libel. I mean, she was like a she was a crazy, amazing, brilliant spitfire of a woman. Um, so Stoker would would hang out with the Wilds. He would hang out with the Fanus, and that was kind of his his Dublin his Dublin milieu. He actually ended up marrying um, a woman named Florence Balcombe, who was Oscar Wilde's fiance before Stoker stole her. Is sort of the story that Oscar tell, tells or told, but you know. Who knows when, when we're talking about the world of Oscar Wilde. Anyway, so, so, so Stoker was, was very much a part of that, that world of the, the Dublin literati. Um, he and Florence moved to London in the 1870s, I think it was 1878 or 1879, and Stoker went to work for the Lyceum Theatre as the first the acting manager and then the business manager. Um, and the person who ran the Lyceum Theatre was, was, was the most famous actor in London, basically in the entire 19th century, a man named Henry Irving. And Stoker worked at the Lyceum Theatre for Henry Irving for the duration of his life. Um, and Stoker died in 19, 1912 of a stroke. Um, so he spent, uh, math, he spent about 25 years um, working for the Lyceum, working for Henry Irving, just a really, really um, integral part of London theater life. And, um, and Irving was a very, very integral part of his life. And over the course of those 25 years, he published, I'm not going to remember the exact number, but it's something like 11 or 12 novels almost all of which you have never heard of and most of which you should never ever read because they are terrible real 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 terrible um he also he also wrote some nonfiction. um he so he wrote that 
before he went to London, that terrible petty clerk book, um, he wrote um, a very, very well-known uh, reflection on Henry Irving called Personal Reminiscences of Henry Irving, which is a, an important biography of Irving and also an important kind of biography of Stoker's own time working in the theater. And then he also wrote a book called Famous Imposters, um, which you know talks about various various actors and also various um, counterfeits throughout the throughout the 19th century. Um, and then he also wrote some short story collections and and a few other things. But so he was a you know he was working in theater. He was a very prolific, if not a very popular writer, um, and and you know was kind of you know intensely intertwined with with everything that was happening in the theater and liter literary world of London. But also at the same time that he he was very much part of this London literary life, he was this giant redheaded bearded guy with an incredibly thick Irish brogue who never for a moment passed, passed as an Englishman while he was living in London. So um, one of the things about Stoker it, it, for, for kind of most of the 20th century is that once people finally started reading Dracula, which was definitely not in 1897, it was published, um, it was not popular, nobody cared about it. In 1897, the best-selling novel was a novel by Richard Marsh called The Beetle, which is, um, Elaine, I feel like this novel would be very important to you, um, which is a novel about this like crazy, strange, shape-shifting Egyptian trans beetle who likes to, who like comes to London and then tries to suck people's faces off. So, you know, that's, that's a good time. That's what people really liked in 1897. None of this crappy vampire shit. Um, but after, after about 1922, when the movie Nosferatu came out, um, Stoker, Stoker's uh, novel had a kind of renaissance. And so once people started reading Dracula and got very excited about it, it became one of the most important novels of the English literary canon. Um, and was that for decades and decades and decades. Um, part of the, you know, part of the Victorian British canon, part of the British Gothic canon, part of the British modernist canon, you know, all sorts of different um, worlds of British academia took Dracula and and made it one of the like one of the key texts of, of its oeuvre and only until not until maybe of the early 1990s did somebody finally stop and say wait a second this British novel that we've all been reading for so long as a British novel is this novel that is so much about um, about Englishness and about the you know the strengths and weaknesses of Englishness and about the you know anxieties about um, about you know British colonialism and the ways in which you know England might be you know invaded by these dangerous others. All of these things that that sort of ways of approaching the novel that really focused on its Englishness. Someone was like, "What about the fact that this is an Irish guy? Have we noticed that? Like, do we care? Does it matter? Should we maybe start talking about the fact that this isn't actually an English novel? That this is a novel." written by an Irish person that features a number of English characters. And maybe that might be something different than, you know, than reading this as a novel by somebody who was, you know, who was English or who believed themselves to be English or who wanted to be English. Like Stoker, Stoker was never English. Stoker, Stoker was, was Irish through and through, no matter how long he lived in London and no matter how integrated and integral he was um, in the, in the uh, British literary and theatrical scene. So, um, so that's one of the things that, that first drew me to Dracula was, you know, the fact that Stoker was Irish and that, you know, when I started reading this novel, it was only, it was only kind of just becoming a thing to talk about Stoker as an Irish, as an Irish writer and to think that maybe we need to approach how we read this novel differently when we read it from the point of view of somebody who, who was Irish than we do from the point of view who's somebody point of view of somebody who was English. Um, so, so that was kind of my point of, of entry, along with just, you know, the fact that there's a lot of fun blood sucking and other important things that, that happen in this text. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, I feel like most of us, so I, I hope that, I hope that folks here had a chance to read Dracula or you've read it before, but I think that even, you know, even if, if you've read Dracula before, the way that most of us come into the world of Dracula is through the millions of adaptations um, that, you know, that have prolifer pro proliferated, that is the word I'm thinking of, proliferated, proliferated basically since the novel um, was published at the end of the 19th century. And I wanted to take just a few, a few minutes and show you these commemorative stamps that, um, that were published in, um, in Ireland in 2012. 
Um, I can't remember if I if I mentioned these the last time I was talking, but I'm just going to share my screen. And what I would love is if um, I'm going to try to share my screen. There we go. So I'd love it if you could just take a few minutes and look at these commemorative stamps. Again, remember these stamps are are trying to commemorate Bram Stoker's death. So the death of an Irish writer um, in 1912, the hundredth year anniversary of his death. And to to just maybe like riff a little bit about, about anything that strikes you about these stamps or that seems weird or that is noticeable. I just want to know what you think about these stamps. I was so excited when I got them in the mail. So feel free to, to unmute yourself and, and say something or if you feel more comfortable um, I can't see the chat while I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see if you're typing anything, but um, but also feel free to, to raise your hand and, and we can call on you. Oh, I should also say, sorry, what I should say is that the two things on the bottom are the stamps and the thing on the top is the envelope that the stamps arrived in. Well, this is Kirk and I'll observe the wonderful stamp in the lower left where you have you have bram stoker but his shadow is dracula and i like that absolutely does that like does the does the shadow look like a familiar dracula to anybody Uh, it looks like the Nosferatu film Dracula to me. It does totally look like the Nosferatu film Dracula. And it also seems strange that it's all cinema, given his focus on theater and playwriting. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, there is something sort of um, both interesting and strange about the fact that we are we are commemorating, like these stamps aren't commemorating any kind of anniversary of Dracula itself. We're not celebrating the, the publication day. We're not celebrating a new edition. We're not celebrating anything except Stoker, the author of Dracula. But um, but even even the stamp that has Stoker in it, we can't see that his, his beard and hair are red in that. Um, has, also, has, uh, uh, this is Phyllis. Um, hi, Phyllis. Also, um, given the Irish fairy stories and the relationship of the Irish attitude towards death and um, decay and cemeteries in terms of um, things like Martin O'Kane's um, Dirty Dust, where it's a novel of all the people who were buried in a village and they're talking to each other from their graves. Um, it seems to be a very Irish thing that they're commemorating not the publication of Dracula, not his birth, <laughs> but his death. I mean, <laughs> that's uh, sort of that black humor thing uh, coming along uh, in there. So, yeah, I love that. I think that that's amazing. I mean, there is like, there's a lot of excitement on Bram Stoker's death day every year. His, he died on April 20th. So like the, <laughs> April 20th is, is a, you know, like the world of social media, everything like there, there are a lot more celebrations of Stoker's death day than there are of Stoker's birthday. That gives new meaning to 420 then, huh? <laughs> we can celebrate however we want. <laughs> and we can now. <laughs> what if what if it also means like the fact that you're celebrating his death, but but Dracula can't die. So right. there's an interesting something and also the fact that Ireland is giving him a stamp and not England or the UK and they're commemorating his death like okay I know you lived in England but we know your Irish roots so we'll at least you're buried back in Ireland I don't know if he actually is buried back in Ireland but something about that yeah I uh, think that that's great yeah and totally the fact that Dracula keeps uh traveling around with his crates of earth right <laughs> and i i totally hear you about the idea that well ireland knows where he is and maybe he'll decide to wake up here you know it's, yeah very cool 
I mean, there is something in, in that respect about the like, you know, so none of these images are at all Irish, right? Like we have Stoker with Nosferatu behind him. We have an image that is taken straight from the Todd Browning movie. And then we have a, you know, a, a movie theater that could be anywhere. But on the stamps, of course, there are Irish stamps. So you just, you, you have the era, the Irish word for Ireland, just like superimposed on top of, on top of all of these images that aren't aren't Irish at all. I mean, it's of course the the design of the stamp, but it's also a very like dramatic superimposition of of the Irish word for Ireland, along with the um, you know the, the price <laughs> of, the, of the stamp. But just a like you know a big red stamp over the black and white images. Like these are the you know these are the conventional images we have when we think about Dracula. These are maybe the you know the things that have been circulating in culture and we're gonna just stamp them with our with with our Irishness to make sure that people people remember and know what they're remembering. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um Margaret Wood, I have a quick question. I'm assuming that Bram Stoker is Irish Protestant and not Irish Catholic though. He was a civil servant, so and his father was as well. So I'm presuming he was Protestant. He was Protestant. He was brought up in the in the Church of in the Church of Ireland. He was baptized there. Um, okay. his, his, so he, he was definitely he definitely grew up Protestant. It's a little bit unclear. So whether or not his mother's family was Protestant the whole time, it seems likely that they were not, given where they where they live and the um, the the kind of um, class position that they that they had. Um, so even though he was he was raised Protestant and was absolutely you know a part of the the um, the middle class Anglo Irish social world when he was in Dublin, um, there's a there's a really good book called Dracula's Crypt by a critic named Joseph Valente that's really interested in the in the fact that that even though Stoker grew up Anglo Irish he he wasn't you know, fully Anglo Irish he he his his mother and his mother's deep attachment to um, to her kind of native Irishness and to her Celtic Sligo roots meant that um, that he was sort of split between the 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 world of Anglo Ireland and the world of 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 a native Catholic Ireland. Um, so so in Dracula script, um, Valente refers to him as an Anglo Celt instead of an instead of Anglo Irish to to um, to draw that kind of Celtic heritage out a little bit more. Okay, thanks. I was curious. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I loved how I didn't realize he was friends with Lefanu, if I'm saying it right. Um, but I read the uh, the house by the churchyard this summer. And um, if there's definitely um, echoes, including the uh, trepanning, is that how you pronounce it? Of, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> oh, okay. But I loved it because the same thing happened in the, in the house by the churchyard. Um, a guy got banged over the head. Um, and somebody was then accused of his murder and they tried to wake him up to, they knew it would kill him. They knew he was going to die anyway, but they tree panned him and they cut a hole, hole in his skull so he could recover long enough to uh, clear the name of the person who was accused of killing him. Um, one of many, many subplots in that thing. It was so hard to do. Um, but one quick thing that really fascinated me, and I know I read this probably in high school, but yeah is the uh, structure of the narrative, how everything is either diary or letter, except for a few scenes. And, and you as reader know more than the characters do um, a lot of times. Um, mm -hmm. Or you'll see the same situation described by different people without them knowing what you know. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that. And if that was, if that, if he always did this, this was sort of his, his tick, or is this why this became such a big, because I don't know anything else about him except for this book. So, yeah, I think that's actually a good a good question to. I'm going to stop screen sharing. If anyone wants to say more about stamps, we can. But I'm going to stop so we can actually start talking about the book, and I can I can see all of you folks again. Um, so no, it wasn't it wasn't Stoker's thing. He um, he did this in Dracula, but he didn't do this in his other novels. So the um, like it, so, I I talked last week a little bit about about what I call his second most famous novel, um, in giant inverted commas because nobody ever reads it, which is his mummy novel, The Jewel of Seven Stars. Um, and the reason that's his second most famous novel is because it's the novel that critics um, 
to the extent that they ever talk about it, say is most like Dracula in its concerns and the way it deals with questions of colonialism and kind of invading foreign others and, and all of these things. Um, but that is a completely straightforward narrative. It is just told from the first person point of view of a lawyer named Malcolm um, as he makes his way through the crazy events that happen in this text. And it isn't, it isn't at all structured the way Dracula is. And, and his other novels are, are also all very straightforward. They're not interested in this, um, in this kind of um, fragmented, fragmented form. So, so because it's not, you know, because it's not Stoker's tick, because it's not like the thing that he does all the time, it makes it even more important to, to talk about when we talk about this book. Um, so I would actually love if we can if we can look at the that little preface bit together as a way to to fill us to get at your question. Okay. So I'm not sure what what editions folk ha folks have, but um, but it's just this like this little tiny bit that is right before right right right, right before the novel starts. Right. Huh. Oh, Somebody. That's that's interesting. Reading, I, reading this now, I hadn't reread it, huh? Phyllis, will yeah. you will you maybe read this out loud? Sure. Um, how these papers have been placed in sequence will be made manifest in the reading of them. All needless matters have been eliminated, so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of later day belief may stand forth as simple fact. Phew, that was. There is throughout no statement of past things wherein memory may err, for all the records chosen are exactly contemporary, given from the standpoints and within the range of knowledge of those who made them. Wow, that tells a lot about, I thank you for pointing that out. That tells a lot about what I was feeling as I was reading this. Thank you. So I'm, I, I'd love to hear what people what people are thinking as you were thinking when you read this the first time or are thinking now that it's it's something that we're focusing on. Um, maybe why the text starts this way or or just even the 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 kind of strangeness of of each of these sentences, what what it is these sentences are saying, what they're trying to tell us, what they're trying to kind of make us think as we as we start this novel. So why why start a novel like this? Well, it's it's almost a sort of a Victorian petty bureaucrat way of uh, convolution, using convoluted language that, you know how when you're a little kid and somebody says, I'm going to tell you a ghost story and it's going to be, and there's a whole lead up to the story. But this is written almost, do you think you're reading a contract to buy a house? You think it, it's, it's is sort of loaded in sort of modern bureaucratic um, phraseology and stuff. And then, of course, the beauty of the whole, um, the first thing you see in when, when you start reading the story is kept in shorthand, right? Which is the business-like way of reducing language to transactional, a commodity that you can share and hide. And um, so it's, it's, it seems to be something I'd never really seen an author do before. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like not just bureaucratic language, but also that this this is focused on process, right? Just like shorthand is is kind of a focus on process. Um, it's it's interested in telling you what the what the process by which this text has come to be is. Well, you know, oh, this is Mike. I mean, realism. Realist fiction always claims the authority of other forms of discourse. You know, it, it grounds its its facticity in other in, in non-fictional forms and assimilates them. And that's, you know, if all of the new technological innovations of his time are incorporated in the book. You know, in you know, a visit from the Goon Squad, we've got texts and 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 tweets, you know, in modern day terms. This is the equivalent of that, which to me it makes it such a proto-modernist novel like Ulysses, you know, in terms of picking up every possible form of, of dict, you know, of, 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 of textual authority and incorporating it to make a claim for its own authenticity. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love the way that you phrase that incorporating all of these different, these different forms <clears throat> to make, to make a claim for its own authenticity. Um, Elaine and then Blair. Yeah, I mean, my first impression reading those first four chapters, right, is that it's almost like a travel log where he's going through these really mundane details about what he's eating and how he's feeling and um, these things that are, are establishing his credibility with the reader. And I feel like that's that same kind of thing as when you read in some 19th century novels where they say, you know, this is the true story of something and I, I have not made any changes, right? To really make you um, to think about this, the writer as having, establishing their credibility, which is so important because then as things become less and less believable, right? We have established both the author and our narrator as very, very um, sort of interested in the mundane and the real. Um, and so then the unreal becomes sort of more surprising and, and we trust our narrator. We trust Jonathan Harkin when he's telling us what's going on and that he's not crazy. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think it's an especially great point given that like, so, you know, we move from this little preface into into Jonathan's diary in which, you know, Jonathan's, you know, Jonathan is, of course, writing in the first person and we, you know, we're in his head for the begin, you know, the entire beginning of the novel. Um, but we start here without without a narrator and without without that kind of like central authoritative sensibility that we're going to get when we move into the world of Jonathan so that the text starts with a, a sort of assertion of detail and authenticity and all of these things, but but without it being tied to a particular narrative voice or a particular kind of um, a particular um, kind of overarching spirit is its own strange phenomenon because when you know when Jonathan is, is offering us this crazy travelogue and I would like us to talk about the, the travelogue aspect of it um, because I think it's really really important. Um, you know we are we are being kind of educated into Jonathan's mindset and Jonathan's point of view. We know who we're hearing. We know who we're listening to. We know whose observations we are privy to, but we have no idea who we're hearing from in this preface. We have no idea whose, whose description this is. We have no idea who's trying to get us to believe them. We have no idea who is insisting that this, you know, that this narrative is trustworthy. It's kind of like insistence from, from the ether. Um, ooh, questions. Um, so Blair and then Barbara and then Sam. Okay, uh, Carl mentioned uh, on the chat a question that I came into tonight's meeting with. I wanted to ask you um, just how widespread this writing technique was in the 19th century. Uh, I read Woman in White years ago and noticed that Wilkie Collins did the same thing, but I'm not uh, I haven't read enough 19th century literature to know how many people did this. I'm impressed with it as a narrative technique because you have to develop different voices that are not, not only uh, consistent within themselves, but distinctive among themselves. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's, it's a question, Renee, for you and perhaps for anybody else in the room who might be more conversant with 19th century literature than I am. Thank you. So, I mean, The Woman in White is, is an excellent example, as, as is The Moonstone, of these other novels that are, are really invested in, in the idea of narrative perspective and what happens, you know, how you, you know, in, in the case of all of these novels, there, there's a mystery involved, there's detection involved. And so, right. um, so Wilkie Collins love to, to write these novels where, you know, ch giant chunks of them are told from different characters point of view. And we get this, this kind of um, refracted or, or fragmentary version of the story. And, and, you know, the narrators are, intrinsically unreliable and and one of the ways we know that is because we keep getting these multiple multiple narrators um one of the things that that is unique about stoker in this novel is that he's not just giving us kind of you know four chunks of the novel each told from a different point of view um 
like that's what happens in the woman in white and the moonstone or maybe maybe more chunks i can't entirely remember how many how many narrators we have in all of those but like the beetle that other 1897 novel also does the same thing so that story gets told from i think four different narrative points of view and you progress your way through them oh yeah clarissa also clarissa does that epistolary novels certainly certainly do that um one of the things that is different about Dracula is that it it's not just kind of narrators in se- in a sequence. Um, it's not you know particular giant chunks of the story being told from whatever character is close to that particular chunk of the story at a, at a given time. It's so piecemeal. It's so small. It's all of these little tiny little tiny um, you know bits of narrative that, as we see in this preface, have been quite deliberately placed in sequence, you know, some things have been eliminated, some things have been, um, uh, some things have, have, you know, been swapped around, like, like the narrative has been quite deliberately constructed out of these teeny little bits, as opposed to being kind of put together in a, in an order that maybe um, makes, makes a more logical sequence on its own. Um, I don't know if any of you have, have, heard um heard of this thing called dracula daily um (laughs) but what it is it's it's a it's a it's a website that that because each of the things in dracula is dated you know has a date on it so they they send you that bit on that date and you just and you read it um but of course like the dates in the novel are not necessarily this in the same order as actual dates so when you get those little bits through dracula daily you get the novel in a different order you get it sequenced differently, not sequenced by this kind of mysterious educational, uh, educational, good Lord, um, this mysterious kind of editorial consciousness. You, you instead get it sequenced quite literally how it's sequenced chronologically, and it's a completely different experience. Um, oh, that's great, Oscar, that, that you've been reading Dracula through Dracula Daily. So, you know, so you, you have that experience of on the one hand, you know, reading the novel as we get it in this, you know, in this ordered, edit, edited sequenced form and on the other hand like what this you know what the experience of reading would be if you were just getting all of the things on the days that they were written or the days they were sent you it's a it's a totally different reading experience so it really kind of draws your attention to the you know to the fact of the compilation of the ordering of the sequencing of the eliminating of the you know of the idea that there is a particular kind of narrative being crafted here for specific reasons instead of just uh, this kind of like vast collection of stuff that's being thrown at you. Barbara, go ahead. Well, two things. Uh, first of all, the uh, I I use part of this book every year, but I this first part I hadn't read for a long time. And um, how there's almost in... Harker's narrative, there's almost no uh, metaphorical language at all. I mean, he, he doesn't say, this reminds me of a hill in such and such place, or, you know, it smelled like such and such. And the other thing, as far as how the, the structure works, is that it's interesting to me that characters are introduced in the letters of other characters. And and, and some of that is seems forced, I think. But I mean, it 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 also means that we don't have much um, metaphorical information about those people either. Tell me what characters you're thinking about. Well, the three the men when they are introduced, it's just suddenly, oh, you know, I'm I've been proposed to by three men. And here they are, one, two, three, and we haven't heard anything about them before, right? And you know, and here we, and it's all through her, uh, Lucy's eyes, and you know, it's not, um, it's an unusual way of doing it, is what I'm trying to say. Convenient. Yeah, convenient. <laughs> so, how do you feel about about? men characters being introduced to us through through a woman's voice well i think that's fairly unusual um yeah i the last thing that i read was um i reread angle of repose and there's some of that in 
that book, but of course that's not a 19th century book. It's a 20th century book. Anyway. I mean, I, I, I have to admit that I, that I kind of love that, you know, we're, you know, we're going to have this, you know, the bulk of this novel is going to involve, you know, this, this group of Englishmen sort of one American yes group good point yeah group of Englishmen plus one American plus one random Dutch guy um you know kind of haphazardly fighting her way towards killing killing the vampire um but the way that we get those you know those those three guys introduced to us is through Lucy telling us how hot they all are and how like you know how excited she is that they've all asked her to to marry her and what what lovely wonderful men they are and how desperately she wishes she could just marry all three of them i mean it's a you know it's a really different um you know this this novel is is explicitly deliberately in all sorts of ways a kind of anti anti-marriage plot novel um <laughs> but there's just something so incredibly delightful to me about you know a, about our 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 Kind of two introductions to marriage being being through um, the the letters of these two of these two women, and especially Lucy, just telling us that these are the, these are characters who are all going to be important to us. Let me tell you about them by telling you that they're all hot and all think that I should be their wife. And isn't that great? And wouldn't it be amazing if we could marry three people? <laughs> well, uh, also, what's interesting is that um, later on the way all these various um, diaries and um, the diaries get um, uh, sort of rationalized is, is by M- Mina or uh, Mina. She takes them all and types them up, right? She translates the shorthand that the doctor can't read and she puts it into TypeScript and makes copies. And, and that becomes the backbone of of how to solve the detective story. And, and it's repeatedly, you know, she's learning shorthand to support her husband and now she's learning the typewriter and um, it's, it's her literal typewriting that helps the Dutch doctor, whatever he is, um, kind of see the whole picture. Yeah, unquestionably. Like Mina, Mina is our hero. Like she's our She's our reproductive hero for all of the all of the much better reproductive ways than <laughs> a woman <laughs> might usually be a reproductive hero. I mean, you know, we, we don't we don't get an assertion of of the identity of the narrator in that in that initial preface. You know, it's it's written very in a very passive voice. There is no I, there is no she, there is no he, there is no nothing. Um but of course, what we come to what we come to learn by the time we get to the end of the section we are reading today is that you know, to the extent that there is an editorial consciousness of this novel, it is Mina, and this novel doesn't exist without Mina. Um, and yeah, as we get to the later half of the novel, and this is something that I would like us to talk about next time, like, um, God, these men folk are are fools and idiots for not recognizing who their who their actual hero is. Mm-hmm. Sam, go ahead. Um, something that, and this kind of ties back to what you were talking about with the travel logs. And then someone had mentioned like a building of trust um, in the characters. Something I really like about the structure also is I almost feel like it makes me feel trusted as a reader to like be intelligent enough to like, or just be paying enough attention um, to be following what's going on and like because it's so many different people and it's like these fragmented bits people are imperfect and the way that we go through our lives we are constantly interacting with different people and getting different parts of information and so it makes it I think it makes me feel trusted as a reader to be able to to almost be like part of the party as well as like it adds to kind of that spookiness where like I'm not just passively reading like I'm actively, there are enough gaps where I'm like actively thinking while I'm reading and that adds to kind of the eeriness. And I really like that with like, I don't know if this book qualifies as like a Penny Dreadful or even if Frankenstein does, I'm not very versed in literature, but I like that same way with Frankenstein also where it's like, there are gaps in what's going on and they're either not gonna get filled until the end of the book or they're not gonna get filled completely ever. And I'm just kind of left with that, like, 
ominence. And I, I just really, really like that. I love that. And I, I love the way you phrase it as, as, as it, it, it kind of insisting that you as a reader have to be an active part of the part of the process of creating the narrative that is, you know, that is going to be this novel. Um, in that preface, um, the, just the, the very first line when it says how these papers have been placed in sequence will be made manifest in the, in the reading of them, I think really speaks to, speaks to your point that, that nothing is going gonna, is gonna to be clear until you read it. Nothing, nothing about the sequencing, nothing about the order, nothing about the meaning, nothing about how, how all of these things connect to each other. The, the way that, that all of that meaning is going to be made is by you reading it by you kind of taking your own, like, you know, your own interpretive capacities and your own kind of willingness to, to, to kind of move in and out of these different narrative voices and to, you know, to trust or not trust different narrative voices and to trust your own abilities to believe or not to believe. Like, that's the, that's the experience of, of the novel. And that's what, that's what it's, it's trying to do to you. So I, I just, I love that it, um, I love that you describe it as, as, as a kind of um, just as, as a kind of um, process of both agency and trust that you as a reader kind of feel like you're being drawn into. Um, because I think it's a really important point. And, and if, you, if you kind of pay attention to the way that, that reading itself works in this novel, I mean, so you have all of these different characters who are reading each other's letters. You have characters who are and aren't reading reading people's diaries um you know you have you have dracula and jonathan in the library in dracula's castle talking about how they feel reading these books about england whether they're train schedules or you know the the law the law list I can't remember what it what it's called like there there is is an, an intense focus in this text on on reading on characters within the novel reading about the kinds of you know, access to power that, that characters do and don't have by reading, what happens if you, if you um, kind of interfere in a character's reading, what happens if you, you know, say like take away certain um, emotional registers that you get by listening to a phonograph recording and instead translate it into something that's read, like reading itself is, is something that's quite important. Uh, do working notes for the novel exist? There are actually, they're at the, um, the oh God, that um, library in Philadelphia, the Rosen, uh, crap. The working notes are all, all at a library in Philadelphia and you can actually, they've been, um, they've been published so you can, you can buy them. They've been um, just photographed and reproduced and then transcribed on, on alternate pages. So Stoker, wrote this novel basically sitting in the British Museum, um, in the, in the what, what used to be the, the British Library, part of the British Museum in the reading room, doing tons of research and like taking copious, copious notes. So his notes are like excessive. So yeah, I, I, love, I love the idea of thinking about like the Rosenbach. Thank you, Kate. Yes, the Rosenbach, the Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia. Um, so if you ever, you know, want to take a trip to Philadelphia and read, read Stoker's notes, they are available to you in the Rosenbach. Um, also a lot of James Joyce stuff in the Rosenbach, a lot of Ulysses notes in there, if you happen to like other, other Irish lit things. Um, but yeah, Courtney, I think that that's a, that's a really good point and an important point that, you know, not only is this novel kind of um, produced for us in this quite deliberately fragmentary form, but also that it was produced out of very fragmentary notes that we're trying to compile information from so many different sources and so many different places. And somehow, you know, the fragmentation of those notes gets translated into this, you know, this fragmented novel structure. John, go ahead. Yeah, this is just to emphasize something that you said a couple of minutes ago, which is all of the passive verbs in this, uh, this prefatory statement um, which implies that there is someone or something or some consciousness that is has ordered them, that they've been placed in sequence, but it doesn't say who. And so for me, this has the structure of a mystery novel from the very beginning. Who has uh, placed these papers in sequence? 
is it the author or is it one of the characters or some someone else and it it talks about uh, um you know the the records uh chosen who has chosen them you know we're 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 given we're teased by giving us the the idea that there is choice and direction and purpose and control but we don't know who done it and and so for me the mystery is there from the very beginning and then one other point about this this preface that i find interesting which is that it makes a a, a truth claim which is the the train the the claim that these are true that this is fact and the evidence for the factness of uh, of this is that it's all people's memories and we know how fallible people's memories are so the proof that it's truth is that people remember these things and so can we rely on anything as fact or or truth in in this in this novel so i'm dying to find out who who done it that is who <laughs> who, who placed these in the order in which the reader interprets them i love that i love that yeah i yeah this um so not only are we are we kind of dislocated from the very, from the very beginning we are we are thrown into some kind of space of the unknown where we have no idea who's talking to us and we have no idea why they're talking to us and we have no idea for what reason they're talking to us um but we also have this you know what what seems to be this really classic statement of authenticity like you know you know everything you see before you is is a real document it's you know it's all true we you know it's it's from the, you know it's taken from the exact moment you know nobody you know nothing has has been you know offered in recollection just all of these these truth statements that john as you say are are also just clear admissions of pure subjectivity like you know, these are all told from people's points of view, and we all know that people are completely untrustworthy, um, and that sure. people's, yeah, that people's points of view are, you know, could oh, tell us anything. Um, and we also, you know, every kind of statement that's supposed to be a statement that reminds us that what we're about to read is a true story is also a statement that tells us that the story has been mediated by someone and something, that, you know, that we are not getting Dracula daily. We're getting we're getting you know papers that have been sequenced by something. That we're not getting all of the papers that were written during this time period. We're getting all the papers that don't seem needless to somebody, whoever whoever that somebody may is may be. That you know that they're all you know all factual documents, but they're factual documents written by people who who are not trustworthy to tell us the facts. So so every kind of insistence on objectivity is is immediately undercut by this simultaneous assertion that that what we're actually getting is a completely subjective version of the story that we're about to hear and that even though you know what we're getting is is truth that is you know perhaps at odds with later day belief we're supposed to believe it anyway but how can we how can we believe it when when we're being told at the same time we're being told to believe it that it's all mediated that it's all subjective that we have no idea if it's true or not and we also have no idea who's telling us this so so that kind of strange dislocation that we that we enter the novel with um and sets us up sets us up for for some kind of um gothic experience that we might not entirely we might not entirely realize until we, you know, until we, until we get in, but we have been set up for it. We've been set up to be dislocated and uncertain and not sure what it is that we should or shouldn't trust. Um, so, Margaret. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, I first read this book when I was 17, and I don't remember reading the preface. Um, but I was immediately drawn in because I was like, oh, my God, Jonathan Harker is so dull. Oh, my God. He's so dull. Yes. He's so dull. Here he is traveling in in Europe in an area he's never been. And he's like going on about getting recipes for his wife to be. I, I just thought he was the dullest dog ever. Um, but it curiously enough drew me in because, of course, he starts out as an incredibly dull character and starts having these unbelievable experiences. As an adult reading it with the preface, I immediately am like, oh, my God, unreliable narrator everywhere. So I immediately distrust all the narrators. 
Um, it's just it's it's a fascinating thing because I literally read this in 1978 when I was it was 17 and have read and reread it multiple times since. Um, I took a real dislike to Dr. Seward this time around. Um, but I'm also going to say, and I'm sorry if it's a little bit, I know we're not supposed to go past chapter 16, but there is an incident where, you know, evidence is possibly destroyed um, and later in the novel. So that, yeah, it, again, raises a question of what did they actually have? Um, there, there's, there's a possible destruction of evidence a little later in the book. And my final note was, and this goes to reading, is because the Count is a reader, his whole plot, I, I mean, he has, he's taught himself everything. He's taught himself the English language about English customs, but he's, it's not only that he's taught himself this, but he's taught himself this in furtherance of a scheme to go out and recruit more undead. So, you know, recruiting undead in Transylvania isn't working well. And so he's created a scheme to go to this great metropolitan, kind of the center of Europe at the time, um, to make more undead. But yeah, it, 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 when Jonathan sees his library, I mean, it's we talk. You talk so eloquently about the reading. He is a reader. For all of the characteristics we might dislike about the count, he's a reader, and he reads and educates himself. I mean, you know, I, I I like that you sort of ended that by saying for all of the, you know, for all the things that we we might dislike about the Count, he he is a reader because it actually it actually casts reading itself into a slightly more complicated, slightly more vampiric light. I mean, if you if you so, you you know, you think about the Count in his library, he is sitting there with this vast library of books about England. You know, he's clearly been reading them. Jonathan tells us at one point he knew he knew more about England than I did. Like he, you know, he is this vociferous reader. He is he is absorbing information from these books. But of course, at the very beginning of Jonathan's travelogue, Jonathan tells us that that's of course what he's been doing about Transylvania. Like he, you know, he's been reading all about Transylvania so he can know about it. He's, you know, he's trying to absorb all of this information, you know, about Eastern Europe, about Transylvania, about how to make chicken paprikash, which incidentally was the um, recipe on the the cover of Milk Street magazine for October. Um, which I swear had to be a, like an October Halloween Dracula vampire reference that there would just be this big chicken popper cush, um on this magazine about cooking. I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah, like, you know, so you, so you have, you know, we're, we're introduced to this novel with Jonathan doing all of this reading. We then kind of move into this world of Castle Dracula and the Count, and we, we see that all of these things that, that we might when we, you know, when we think of Jonathan doing it, um, and Elaine, this goes back to your your point about it being a travelogue. Like this is kind of the the structure of the Western European travelogue. Like the, you know, the the British person or the Western European person, um, you know, absorbs as much information as they possibly can about this, you know, other foreign place that they're going, and then digests it for us as you know Western European or British readers. And that kind of process of, of absorbing all of that information and translating it for us and, and you know, showing us that this, you know, British consciousness is a, is a master of this information, like that becomes a very kind of colonial or imperial process. So we see Jonathan doing that, but then we see Dracula doing it right back to Jonathan. Like, you know, Jonathan has tried to master Transylvania. Well, Dracula has been a hell of a lot better at mastering England than Jonathan has about mastering Transylvania. And then we take one further step back and we realize actually that's what Stoker did the entire time that he was writing this novel. He was just reading vociferously and trying to master all of these different kinds of histories and all of these different kinds of legends and, you know, all of these other kinds of Irish Gothic novels that like that process of, of reading as, as possession, reading as mastery, reading as, as, uh, as this quite, you know, quite vampiric act has been happening at all of these different levels of the novel. And then also the preface is kind of telling us that we have to do that too. All matters, you know, how these how these records have been placed in sequence will be made manifest in the reading of them. Like we as readers, you know, trustworthy, agential readers that we are, we also have to perform this kind of active mastery. So so that the, the kind of vampirism of reading that we see in the count in that library that becomes so creepy um, and that's kind of immediately followed by 
Jonathan like nicking himself and and the first like vampiric really vampiric moment where Dracula's like ah god I want to lick that like what are you doing um that like you know that 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 kind of you know vampiric relationship to information is kind of reverberates through a number of levels in the text until it finally lands back with us where we you know we're the ones who have to who have to also possess and absorb and master through this process of reading and so you know so maybe we like Dracula more for being reading or maybe we realize that we ourselves are vampiric readers too um, and we all you know we all have to have to share in this in this process Mike go ahead Oh, you know, there's a vampire tension at the heart of the English common law and the English um, legal tradition, where I think you have to recontextualize this whole notion of authenticity and testimony. The con what is the most, the most persuasive evidence in an English law court? It's direct testimony by someone who observed an event. That's what we're told we're getting from all of the different narrators. We get newspaper reporters, we get Mina, we get Lucy's letters. They're all reporting directly on something they had physical experience of. That is the most, that's the most authentic, most trustworthy evidence in English courts. Yet, we all, and, and that's why the emphasis on contemporaneity in the novel, that they're always catching up to each other. And Mina's always using her carbon paper to put together a complete set of everything right up to the minute so they can all read it together. Contemporaneity is the, is the most trustworthy thing in English law but you've got a tension between that and documentary evidence you know a vampiric uh, tension as you explained it but I think the whole the whole emphasis on this is the recorded testimony of people who witnessed the events they're describing that goes back to English common law and and we have to rehistoricize this and put it in that context this is about what is the most trustworthy and truthful thing in its testimony right and that's why you have cross-examination yeah, God, I love that. And I also love, I mean, love thinking about this in terms of, in terms of testimony, because that, you know, that's so much a part of, you know, of English detective fiction also, like, you know, what happens if we think about this as testimony, who were we trying to prove what to, like, you know, what, who are we trying to condemn or, or, you know, what story are we trying to prove is true? I mean, there's something, there's something really interesting about you know, about thinking about it, not simply in terms of, um, of the construction of the narrative, which of course is also, you know, a key, a key part of the construction of testimony. But if you think about it in terms of testimony, I mean, Jonathan, of course, is a lawyer and thinks about everything I would imagine in terms of testimony. Who, what are we testifying to? Like who, you know, what, what are we trying to prove to whom? It's also a, a just kind of a, a, a weird a weird and interesting and, and equally dislocating way to maybe to maybe think about this, especially given the you know the the kind of lack of um, uh, lack of of subject in that first in that first preface. Who's testifying to what and why? Um, well, that brings me back to one of my favorite podcasts, um, Sisters in Law, which is four female um, prosecutors who uh, write about talk about. Um, once a week about all those things going on with Trump and election denial and stuff like that, and the Oath Keepers trial. And then the last uh, essay about the Oath Keepers trial, they're also law professors, a lot of them. This woman said that she teaches her first year law students that the job of the jury is to determine what the facts are. They listen to the testimony and they decide which testimony stands up. And and th those are the facts. And then she had a thing that she said, and if they find that the facts do not support a conviction, the person is deemed not guilty, but they're not deemed innocent. And and I think this is going around here. I mean, that that who are we are the readers the jury? You know, are we going to decide this? Or who's and goodness knows who the judge is, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do like that sense, and one of uh, somebody else was talking about the the agency that you get as a reader. Because I was reading this um, after reading Dorothy Richardson, and that can kind of go a little slowly. Um, and and this, I was like, oh, I'm going to get back to Dracula. And you know, and it's even though there's a sort of stumbling, overwrought, 
the the girly talk about the boys and stuff like that. You know, you just you just kept oh, it's going to be Jonathan Harker's diary next. Oh, okay, it, it really um, it's a it's a wonderful device. But I do think there's a lot of the legal stuff. I think that legal point was really well made. That 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 is what we've all grown up with too. English common law is the basis of American anyway, United States, you know, litigation. So um, that's that's all. Anyway. I'm curious about, about what, so in some ways we kind of start this novel three separate times, right? Like we, we start with the preface and then we start with Jonathan's diary and we get Jonathan's diary for longer than we get basically anything else um, in this entire novel. And then we start again when we get to chapter five with the letters between Nina and Lucy. So in some ways, you know, if we, if we skip over the preface and we just start with Jonathan's diary, we're not entirely yet sure that like what we're going to get is this novel that is, you know, composed of all of these different fragments from all of these different points of view, because the first, I don't know, 50 pages of the novel or so are all from Jonathan's point of view. And um, I can't remember who it was that said that Jonathan's the most boring character ever, but I mean, you know, Jonathan is, yes, Margaret, yes, that was you. Like Jonathan is a pretty dull character. I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula from 1992, where Keanu Reeves plays Jonathan, and he plays, like, it is the most wooden acting job you could possibly ever imagine. I mean, like, many things are wonderful about Keanu Reeves, but, like, his acting in that movie feels like not one of them. Um, until you think to yourself, well, but maybe actually Jonathan Harker is the most wooden character that's ever existed. And actually what we're seeing here is a brilliant acting job by Keanu Reeves as he performs complete characterless woodenness for us in this, in this film. Like maybe, maybe that's actually what's happening. Maybe it's like fucking with our heads that way. Um, but there, but there's something quite, um, you know, like Jonathan is, is, is a kind of interesting character to, to introduce us to this completely crazy world of, of Dracula, of vampires, of, you know, of all of the things that are happening in, in Castle Dracula and all of the things that are going to happen throughout, throughout this novel. So I, I was just curious about, you know, what, what other folks have thought about Jonathan's diary, um, about the way Jonathan is, is relating these incidents to us, if there were any particular moments in Jonathan's diary that that you wanted us to focus on or or talk about um Mike do you still have your hand up or or okay Sam go ahead um so I don't know where this quote is from but it this kind of question makes me think of this quote where it's like you wouldn't know to suspect a monster on a bright and sunny day of course, like if it was dark and raining and cold, you would be suspicious. You'd have, you know, you'd have your pepper spray out. But like <laughs> on a bright, sunny day, you don't know to be suspicious. And I, I almost feel like that's what his character gives us. Where like it's kind of a, it's a spooky book, but we're like confronted first and foremost with this like very average, like guy who's just talking about his wife and like recipes, um, and like. I feel like it almost kind of brings your guard down a little bit so that like as things start developing it almost is like more surprising um and I actually really like that about it yeah I think that that's great especially you know so he's 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 super boring he is just like recording recipes for us he's provided he's giving us something that you know if we if we were 19th century readers who had who had read travel writing across the 19th century because it was a really popular genre like the first few pages of of this novel would feel really familiar to us even you know even on top of Jonathan just seeming kind of like your very average middle class English writer um we would also just recognize the genre he's writing in oh you know this is you know this is a British person traveling in in foreign lands and so he's going to he's going to tell us about the things he sees he's going to describe the peasant clothing he's going to you know describe how much he suddenly likes paprika he's gonna you know he's gonna he's gonna do this very mundane recording of what it is he's seeing and we're going to be lulled in by him. We're going to identify with him. We're going to recognize him because we too are probably middle-class um, British readers. 
and then we're going to get fucked up by what happens next. So yeah, the like the idea that it's, it's drawing you in in this very, you know, very um, easy, soothing, familiar way, because the point is that it's going to, it's going to unsettle you as you, as you move forward. Miriam, go ahead. Something that surprised me in this reading that I missed in my first reading is that in a very traditional sense, if we read the first section as a Gothic setup, Jonathan is our ingenue. He is the innocent young thing pulled to a house with a dark secret in which everyone is lying to him. And I only, you know, he is our Jane Eyre. And that even though none of the other narrators are in quite so traditional a Gothic novel, his diary in that first section has that consistent air of awful realization as he races to discover the dark secret of this dark house before he is utterly trapped within it. Yes, I love that. I love that Jonathan as the as the ingenue. Um, I actually think a, a really good place to talk about that is um, is that section. I I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure that we um, we got to it. Um, So it's in, it's in chapter three and it's, you know, it's the, it's the famous bit when Jonathan gets vamped by the, the dangerous brides of, of Dracula, the dangerous three ladies. Um, but, but with respect to the, the idea of Jonathan being this, you know, being the kind of Gothic heroine that gets drawn into this, into this, you know, dark castle where there's a mystery where, you know, where there's, um, you know, there's danger where, where he's imperiled, um, there's a moment right before, right before he gets vamped. Um, so for me, I don't think any of you have my have my edition. Um, but if you if you can find the passage where he gets vamped, if you look right above it, so Jonathan has just figured out that like something weird is going on with Dracula. Dracula is not okay. There's like fucked up things about this castle. Um, like. That Dracula is something of a monster and he's realized he's trapped and he's scared, but he's also, he's angry and he's rebelling. Um, and so the Count has told him that he's not allowed to go to, you know, this part of the castle, um, which we find out in a few pages is because that's where, that's where the, the three vampy ladies live. But Jonathan has no interest in following Dracula's directions anymore. And he's going to, you know, he's going to be rebellious and he's going to, you know, whatever. Um, so he, he goes into this place in the castle he's not supposed to be in. Um, there's a paragraph that starts, um, when I had written in my diary and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleep. I felt sleepy. Um, just wanna make sure I, yeah, Oops, sorry. That's where I wanna start. Um, so then he goes on and he says, um, Wait, is that where I want to start? Hold on, give me one moment. Oh no, I want to start before that actually. Okay. He's landed in the castle. He's landed in this part of the castle he's not supposed to be in. Um, there's a very, very, very long paragraph that begins um, 15th of May. And in the middle of that paragraph, he starts talking about this room that he's landed in. And he says, this was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in, the, in bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comfort than any I had seen. The windows were curtainless, and the yellow moonlight flooding in through the diamond panes enabled one to see even colors whilst it softened the wealth of dust which lay over all and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still, it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come to hate from the presence of the Count. And after trying a little to school my nerves, I found a soft quietude come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen with much thought and many blushes, her ill-spelt love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand all that has happened since I closed it last. It is the 19th century up to date with a vengeance. 
And yet, unless my senses deceive me, the old centuries had and have powers of their own, which mere modernity cannot kill. And then just a few paragraphs later, um, and this is just before he wakes up to the vampy, to the vampy ladies, he says, I determined not to return, to return tonight to the gloom haunted rooms, but to sleep here where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives while their gentle breasts were sad for their men folks away in the midst of the remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner so that as I lay, I could look at the lovely view to east and south and unthinking of and uncaring for the dust, compose myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so, but I fear for all that followed was startlingly real. So, so real that now sitting here in the broad full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. And then he, he goes on to um, describe how much he wants to be kissed by the voluptuous red-lipped vampire ladies. Um, but I wanted to talk about this earlier bit a little bit, um, especially in relation Miriam, to what you're just saying about Jonathan, Jonathan is the ingenue, Jonathan is the imperiled heroine. Um, like this is a really, this is a really strange moment preceding what is one of the most, you know, dramatic vamping scenes that we get in this novel. This idea that Jonathan, you know, he's mad at the count, he feels trapped, he doesn't like it, he wanders into this place where he's not supposed to wander. And he sits down and looks around and says, oh, this is clearly where the ladies lived. I like it here. It's calming. It's soothing. It's nice. Now I'm going to imagine the ladies and what are they doing? They're writing love letters to their menfolk. They're ill spelling them. They're blushing. I mean, this is like an incredibly weird, detailed fantasy of these fictional, completely fictional perhaps totally non-existent ladies who may or may not ever exist. There's no evidence really that like anybody has ever lived in this castle except Dracula. And Jonathan is like spinning this entire fantasy to himself about this, this being the, the lady place. And he's sitting at the desk where the ladies sat and he's writing in his diary, like they were writing their letters, except his, I would imagine in his mind is, you know, better spelt and not as blushing. Um, and then he says it was the 19th century up to date with a vengeance. And then, you know, he, you know, spins his wheels a little bit. And then he tells us again that he's now going to go to sleep in this room where the ladies, where the ladies went to sleep, you know, where they, you know, where they blushed and they longed for, again, they're longing for their menfolk. The ladies are always just longing for their menfolk because, you know, I guess that's what ladies do all the time. Um, and, you know, and like that for him is this very consoling moment this very consoling gesture that he's like he's found a lady place and then what happens Mike you you unmuted no <laughs> Elaine yes ladies attack no I mean you you had I mean the feminization of Jonathan is you know one of the more interesting gender gender bending aspects of the novel um calling him the ingenue is so perfect uh, i i just i mean what you said just makes so much sense i mean i wasn't um but it, it's it's bizarre because he met, you know think of all the things you've said about reading writing and the anti-marriage plot and the all he he's imagining women writing but in a way that is so different from the way the women in the novel actually write mina doesn't blush she doesn't misspell she, she's a perfect writer um you know why why does you know what what is this attempting to show about his consciousness and about the assumptions that english middle class men make about women but but the the, the pure feminization of him before it kiss me with those red lips comes up is uh that's what i thought it was about it was about throwy feminizing him and and again that goes that goes into all the things about the plot that are not about the traditional male female relationships about marriage plots or about anything else um you know, and he seems like a purely sexless guy. It's not clear that he and me never sleep together. They lie together next to each other. They don't seem to ever have sex. I mean, you tell me. Um. 
I mean, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there. It does. It is true that basically the only, the only place where, where there isn't sex in this novel is between Mina and Jonathan, our two married people. Like if you rem, if you remember, um, we'll, we'll come back to this scene in a moment. But if, if you remember Mina describing when she, when she finally goes to, you know, Jonathan has been rescued and she, you know, she goes to the the convent hospital to marry him, and she describes in great detail like the ways in which she ties up his diary, you know, so he's, you know, he's this, this, the record of this, like, um, incredible desire to be kissed by the red lips of these ladies is in this journal. Like it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the most kind of, um, obviously sexy scenes in this novel. Mina has promised Jonathan, she is not going to read his journal, but even more than promising that she's not going to read this journal. She takes it, she covers it in paper, she ties up the paper. She then like, you know, seals the the ties and she tucks it away. I mean, she like seals up this evidence of Jonathan's desire first by paper and then by string and then by wax and then she hides it away and then she promises she's never going to read it and that's the consummation of their marriage. It's like the pure, like the the triple layered repression of all desire is like the at the at the core of Mina and Jonathan's marriage. So it, you know. It's not just that that like there doesn't seem to be any sex in their in their marriage, you know. Even like there's a moment later, I I don't think I don't think it's in the section we read, but there's a moment where like Dr. Seward I think says something like, "I heard them going at it in their room," but what he means is he heard them typing. <laughs> so you know, so so we get this over and over, and it like it feels like a, a little bit of a of a joke in the novel um, that like that's just like whatever's happening to them, it's just going to be the like reproduction and repression of. Um, of of writing, um, but yeah, that you know that 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 we we kind of begin here, you know, with this, you know, not just with the 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 kind of unsexed marriage that we get later, but with you know with Jonathan being feminized in this way, and then you know, and then being feminized in the you know in in the next way, which is that he you know he becomes this you know this passive recipient of of these women's women's attentions. Barbara, go ahead. Well, back to what was said before. I mean, this also plays into, I mean, we have the unreliable narr- narrator. We have Jonathan, who is dull. And we have Jonathan, who is not too smart. And Jonathan, who uh, is sexist. So he assumes that he's going to be in this room with these women and they are going to just want to ravish him. That's his assumption. And so that's another layer of what we don't really know what's true. Right. (laughs) Um, And it's interesting to me because that has become one of the, what do you say? Tropes of a lot of Dracula uh, movies and shows where at the moment that they're being vamped that there's this sexual feeling that they seem to have um both on both sides so it, it it's it's a brilliant thing there i think <laughs> yeah absolutely miriam go ahead uh, with that scene of threatening feminine hunger One thing that surprised me is usually we see vampires eating down the power dynamic. Dracula eats young women. The women, the Roman vampires eat children. Include that is that is what Dracula brings to lure them off Jonathan. That is what Lucy threatens later. So we have everyone munching on the people that they could socially dominate, except for this scene where we have misdirected feminine hunger pointing toward Jonathan, our bright young thing that then gets redirected. And I'm wondering how that works with the sexualized reading of vampirism, both in this book and in the wider culture. I mean, how do, how do you think it works? Um, well, I think that that scene, that most sexualized scene is aberrant. And then we see Dracula redirecting their hunger toward a child as a way of bringing it back into that hierarchy. They don't get to eat Jonathan, at least not yet. They, eat to, they get to eat this kid. And so we have Dracula as the aristocrat, even though he's the monster, he is imposing some order and he is ordering the hungers of these women who are his subordinates. 
Yeah, I mean, and I think I think another I think that's absolutely true. And I think I think another another way to think about it and exactly the terms that you're offering is is that you know when Jonathan when Jonathan becomes their their object of like their snacking object, um, that fucks with the power dynamic and the power structure and the social structure that, you know, that that is a moment when, you know, when Jonathan, um, when Jonathan is no longer at the top of the, at the top of the pecking order. Um, and, you know, Dracula, Dracula kind of revises that and fixes that, but, but like, that's part of the reason that there, I think there's such a, like such a charge to that moment, um, not just for readers, but for Jonathan, for Jonathan also is because, you know, he, he is all of a sudden being, positioned quite differently than his, you know, his usual kind of British masculine positioning would, um, would suggest. And, you know, and it's kind of started when he's, when he begins kind of feminizing himself in that, you know, in the scene that precedes it, but then, you know, that thing that he's doing to himself becomes kind of um, reproduced and writ large when, when he suddenly looks up and sees the, the ladies above him wanting to take a snack. Margaret and then Sam. But the interesting point is that Dracula himself is going to move Jonathan down on that hierarchy. I mean, he explicitly, you know, just before he leaves the castle, remember Jonathan opens his door and hears Dracula promising to give him to the ladies. So there's a sense in which Dracula himself is going to use up Jonathan or turn him into a husk and then give him as a, as a physical husk to the ladies. But he promises Jonathan to him when he himself leaves the castle. Um, which I find kind of an interesting circle. I don't know. It's, you know, the count himself. I mean, what his effect on Jonathan. I'm not sure I entirely understand it. And I know there's the whole homoerotic thing. I don't feel like it's a homoerotic relationship, but Dracula is definitely sucking the life out of Jonathan, even if he's not sucking his blood. Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, you know, the, the, there are like a million different ways that people have done queer readings of this text, some of which focus on Dracula and Jonathan, some of which focus on um, on Dracula and all of the other men in the novel. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's about sex and sometimes those queer readings are, are more focused on power and how power, you know, how power is and isn't shifting between these various, these various characters. Um, To me, it's probably like maybe less important if, you know, if Dracula has the hots for Jonathan or Jonathan has the hots for Dracula. It's like, I think the, the power question feels, feels more important in the way that you're, in the way that you're talking about, like, and especially I think in, in thinking back to, to this being a novel by an Irish writer, not by, not by an English writer, not by a British writer, all of the ways that the text is staging the disempowerment of British characters, especially British male characters, especially certain kinds of British masculinity. Like there's, there's one particular moment, especially um, after, um, after Lucy dies, when I think it's Dr. Seward in his diary, he's describing how distraught Arthur is. And he says specifically like that Arthur's stalwart manhood has shrunk. Like that's how he describes Arthur's like emotional distress and everything that's happened happened to Lucy. And so, so, so there, there are clearly ways in which the novel is, is thinking specifically about British masculinity and all the ways in which that masculinity is, is being, um, is being kind of undermined or being disempowered. And so I feel like the relationship between Dracula and Jonathan is, is one really good and interesting place to think about how and why the, the, the text is interested in, in sort of suggesting that like, British max British British masculinity is not is not at the apex of power, no matter how powerful it believes itself to be. Um, and that, you know, and that maybe the 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 kind of trajectory of the novel, which you know, a lot of people have argued for a very long time, is about reestablishing the order in which British masculinity, you know, once again resumes its place at the, you know, at the apex of, you know, social and political power, because, you know. Not going to give anything away here when I suggest that at the end that you know the vampire, you know, gets gets it in the end. Um, I won't tell you how. I won't tell you all the ways that's complicated. Um, 
you know, but that, that's a that's a really important reestablishment of a certain kind of British masculine patriarchal order. And that's the that's the kind of ultimate aim of this novel is to introduce the possibility that British masculinity is, you know, is 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 falling on its ass, but then, you know, it shows us through the, you know, through the various things that happen that actually, you know, British masculinity is fine in the end and that, you know, we can reestablish, our, you know, the, the power structures we expect. Um, you know, if it's a novel written by an Irish guy who who isn't, in fact, you know, really like in and for those kinds of British patriarchal power structures, like maybe the text isn't actually interested in reestablishing British masculine patriarchal power. Like maybe it's actually quite a bit more interested in in all of the ways that that power is unstable or or can be um, can be destabilized by you know by these other other kinds of energies and other kinds of forces. Like maybe it's actually the the disempowerment or the destabilization of that particular kind of masculinity that 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 is at stake here and that you know is you know kind of like the moments in the novel when maybe we as readers are are offered the most pleasure. Um, that there's something there's something important about that and something political about that beyond just it being pleasurable and fun to see like you know Jonathan doing whatever the fuck Jonathan's doing. Sam, go ahead. I mean, I think what I was going to say is like largely kind of what y'all just talked about, but um, I always, I mean, I I agree that I don't really the first and foremost reading that I get is not like a homoerotic relationship between. Jonathan and Dracula, but I know those readings and I love those readings, you know, like big Anne Rice fan. Um, but I almost see it as like it's showing that power, at least like in the kind of like colonial British epistemologies of like how power is conceived there as like a largely gendered thing. And so Jonathan almost goes through this like experience of like normally the British middle to upper class man is the one who's like out on the prowl and like has that and that sense of power is tied to the social status of man and so like gender is inherently like this like social thing that doesn't just say like sex it says like social standing and he all of a sudden gets this experience of like being feminized through being within the castle and being within con like the context of someone above him in power and whether that's because it's like kind of royalty or because it's like the idea of like vampires inherently are going to be above humans or it's kind of like I don't know, whatever reading you want to give to it I really like that and so even when he's like oh like I want these women to ravish me he's not saying I want to ravish these women he's not saying I want to kiss their red lips he's saying I want them to kiss me I want them to ravish me and so it's like the sexist idea of woman but even in his fantasies he's like he's the receiver which is normally like the feminized role um which I really like like I like how that kind of fucks with gender and then in terms of like the kind of overarching arc of like British masculinity being broken down and by the end kind of being like pushed through I almost feel like like there was so much resistance to British colonial rule so often all over the globe kind of the whole like the sun, the sun doesn't set on the British Empire but people still tried to make it so it would um but because of the military might a lot of resistance often got pushed down but I think it almost is like an idea that like the genders of all the characters who then fight and kill Dracula they're all irrevocably changed by the end of the book like they don't get to go back to who they were at the beginning so even though Dracula is gone they're different and they have to live with the legacy of what happened and so it's almost like resistance might be futile like resistance to like british masculinity but it doesn't mean that it isn't important to still resist it because it can still damn it's not um impenetrable it, like it, it it can't there are chinks in the armor um but yeah i really like that yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you made so many important points there. Um, the last one to take the last one first. I mean, the idea that there there, you know, that that over the course of this text, what we're going to see over and over again is the revelation of those of those chinks and all of the ways that 
like all of the ways that British masculinity is insufficient. I mean, we see it, we see it already in the in the sections we've read now when, you know, instead of having a group of British men fighting, you know, fighting the vampire or learning about the vampire, like they 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 need they need an American. They need a Dutch guy who has a different kind of knowledge than the kind of knowledge that, you know, they've all learned in their, you know, in their in their British schools. Like like they need something, they need to be supplemented. What they have isn't isn't enough. Um, and, you know, and, and as you say, like the idea that, that, you know, as we, as we move through this text, I mean, we see it, we see it already with Jonathan, like, like they are, they don't come out of this unscathed. Um, and we, we just see, we see over and over again, the ways that they, their inability to get, to get beyond their own kind of British male sensibility is going to fuck them over. Like it's like, that's the, they are going to make mistakes because of the things that they are and aren't willing to understand about people who don't fit into the category that they, um, that they inhabit and the ways in which these alternative categories, these alternative identities, these alternative, you know, gender, um, these alternative genders, all of the ways that, that these people who occupy different identities and different positions have important have important kinds of power in this text the more they don't see it the more bad shit happens and so that i think that you know sam the point that you're making about you know about this idea that that like um that kind of british power writ large was being pushed against constantly throughout the 19th century by all of the people that that british power was oppressing like we i think that 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 there are uh, so many ways that that this text shows us that and shows us shows us that that power um, isn't monolithic in the way that kind of the British Empire imagined itself to be. Um, but I, then I think another point that you made that that was really important and that's really interesting in in terms of Jonathan's gender identity in this passage when he's you know when he is just so like God, he loves being passive. Like he loves just laying there while they like do whatever they're going to do and telling us how, you know, how voluptuous they are and how, you know, how their voices sound and how it's gross, but also he really likes it, but it's gross, but God, isn't it also really amazing? I mean, it, you know, the, the way that he's narrating it. Um, this is one of those moments where, where I feel like it's, it's really important to, to remember that he is, he is writing this for us. I mean, you know, Stoker is writing it for us, but like, this is, this is Jonathan's point of view. This isn't Jonathan, you know, this isn't somebody else telling us what Jonathan thought or imagining what Jonathan thought, you know, this isn't, this also isn't happening in the moment. Like this is, this is Jonathan the next morning recollecting this incident and what's happened. And I mean, Jonathan, as, as we've discussed, is really fucking boring throughout the much of this journal. Like he's, you know, describing the, the, you know, the paprika and the, costume all of the things that we've talked about like like he is not a vibrant and ecstatic writer in the way that maybe some of the other characters in this novel are vibrant ecstatic writers he is recording things in his journal in this very like plotting um well I'll just say plotting in this very plotting very straightforward way for the most part um, and there are, you know, there are moments when he gets more excited, like when he decides that he is going to invent this story about the blushing ladies writing their um, misspelt love letters. So like, you know, he has moments, but this is the moment, like this is the moment when Jonathan explodes onto the page as like an ecstatic writer where he is just, whatever he, he, he felt in the moment of, of experiencing these ladies, um, whatever, you know, like what we have is his is his delight in writing about it, in telling us about it, in describing it in all of its intimate, physical, sensual detail. Like that's Jonathan writing that for us, and that that's its own. Like that feels like its own, um, it its own well, sort of sort of special thing. But it you know it it tells us that that not only is you know is Jonathan's Jonathan kind of assuming a more passive, more traditionally, conventionally fem feminine role in that, like in that particular kind of sexualized scene, but that he likes it. Like he really, really, really likes it. it. He doesn't feel disempowered by it. He likes it enough to describe it to us in the most ecstatic, descriptive, kind of, like vibrant language that he 
he can like that's what he wants to that's what he get that's what he gives us in this diary that's in many ways far more than than the relation of the experience i think that that is why he doesn't want mina to read it because it's clear from his writing that he liked it and he liked recollecting it and he liked reproducing it like that's part of the that's part of the sexual charge for him miriam go ahead I want to pull two more moments into this discussion of gender and power and modernity in this text, uh, because even though as far as we can see, the marriage between the Harkers is sexless, it's also is sexless, it's also presented as uh, well balanced and companionate that Mina is very present throughout Jonathan's journal as the one he wants to give the recipes to, as the one he is noting things down to tell about, and as the one whose reaction he's imagining. And so the moments I want to pull into this conversation first are Mina's, uh, a moment that confused me when Mina reflects on how she isn't one of those new women, how even though she is learning shorthand and she is the archetypist and she is planning to support her solicitor husband in his practice, she isn't one of those new women who would dare propose to him, um, which is still a very specific image of gender and modernity. And the other moment I want to pull into this conversation is later in the text when Dr. Van Helsing congratulates Mina on her masculine brain. And both of these are moments of, um, of, of sort of liminal or distinct or perhaps hypocritical gender from Mina that are, I think, balancing out the moments of distinct and liminal gender from Jonathan. And given that in the passage you read just before he is accosted, Jonathan is reflecting that he is the modern update of the former lady. So there is that element of modernity versus the past. I think that these three moments together present an image of how gender, power, and modernity are working for this couple. I think that that is, that's absolutely great. I, the, like the moment you're describing, like when Mina, because she, she mentions it twice, on, like on one page in there, she says, you know, something about the way that she and Lucy were eating, like that, you know, that they were shocking, but even a new woman. And then she says, I can't remember exactly, but like, but you know, we're not, we're not new women. Like we're not, we're not into, into that. Um, and yet, as you say, she is like she she is a middle class woman. She she works for a living. She is learning all of the technology. Um, I'd like to imagine that she might ride a bicycle on her own if one were made available to her. In you know in the way in the way of new women, um, you know that she's she's explicitly offered to us in as a contrast to the kind of femininity that Lucy is is you know, is given to us as having, and, you know, and there, there are lots of, um, of readings of the novel that, that I think are quite, I don't love them because they, they spend a lot of time telling us that, like, the reason that Lucy gets vamped in this novel is because she deserves it, because she, you know, because she's kind of a slut, because she wants to marry three people, because she, um, you know, to live. Yeah, too exactly, too sexy to live, and you know, and and what we what we end up with um, at the the very end of the section we read today, when you know she has become the blue for lady, she's a vampire, she's voluptuous, she's sexy, she's telling Arthur to come with her. But the only way that 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 kind of femininity can possibly um, uh, be countered is you know is by this this act of staking, which is a you know as I'm sure many, many of you noticed when you read it with, you know, Arthur's hand coming up and down like Thor and, you know, the writhing and the, like, it's, it's a very, it's a very sexualized scene. It's a very, very rapey scene. And it's a corrective rape by the time, you know, you know, Lucy, you know, they, they go into that with Lucy being this, you know, voluptuous red lip, sexy vampire. And after, after they stake her, she's returned to, you know, to ordinary Lucy, to, you know, to not voluptuous Lucy, to the, to the correct kind of Lucy. And so there are a lot of conversations about, you know, about the way femininity is being represented in here that say, you know, Lucy is the wrong kind of femininity and Mina is basically the right kind of femininity, except she has these sort of weird masculinities to her. And that actually, that makes her susceptible in her, in her own ways. And so like, so, you know, these readings that really want to, want to make sure we understand that femininity and, and gender boundaries are being 
distinctly policed in this text, especially where the women characters are concerned. They're not being policed where the male characters are concerned because Jonathan is allowed to, you know, be as ladylike as he wants and be as much of, you know, a passive recipient as he wants. And, um, you know, and, and later, like, you know, all of the men are allowed to kind of like mingle their fluids in Lucy as they all give her blood transfusions. And then Dracula is allowed to suck all of their blood out. And so like, Lucy can just be a, you know, a, a bodily vehicle for the men to, um, to secretly and specially commingle all of their stuff. And that's exciting for them. Like, there are all sorts of ways in which the, the like, criticism does strange, strange things to, to, I think, maybe enforce quite problematic, um, not just gender representations in the novel, but to, to kind of, you know, reproduce them and, and write them even larger than maybe we, you know, we get them, we get them in in the text, but um, but there is on both sides, you know, no matter how you want to, like how you, you do or don't want to read the, the kind of gender fluidities, they're being, they're being presented to us. And, and Mina in particular, I think is more, maybe a little bit more worried about them than some, like Lucy is not at all worried about the fact that she wants to marry three men. Like this is not a problem to her. And it's not also not a problem to Mina really. Like, Lucy can sort of like be whatever kind of woman she wants, but Mina is a, is a little bit worried about what kind of woman she is. Um, and I feel like, I mean, one of the, one of the places where you can see that quite interestingly, I think is, um, is in the very first letter that she writes to Lucy. Um, so it's the very beginning of chapter five. And this is another moment where, where I, where I'm very interested in the actual, um, like the style of writing in the same way I am in the in the sexy lady Jonathan getting vamp scene like I'm really interested in the, in what the style of writing tells us in that scene and Mina's first letter is another moment like that um if you just sort of like so the life of an assistant school mistress is sometimes trying that might be the most boring sentence that has ever been written by anybody and then it's followed by a really exciting sentence I am longing to be with you and by the sea where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. So, you know, this is, this is Mina thinking about, you know, that she's coming to visit Lucy and this is like a moment in which she is excited about seeing Lucy. And then she returns to talking about Jonathan. So she's, she's excited about talking freely and building castles in the air and she's longing to be with Lucy. And then she says, I have been working very hard lately because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies and I have been practicing shorthand assiduously. When we are married, I shall be able to be useful for Jonathan. And if I can, if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practicing very hard. Again, maybe one of the most boring, if slightly longer sentences that's ever been written. Um, and so like, th there's just like, There's something about the way that that not only the novel but the characters themselves are presenting their yes exactly <laughs> another moment where Mina's and Jonathan's relationship takes the form of typing and like where the friendship between Lucy and Mina seems so much more charged and so much more exciting and so much more you know so much more erotic like I am longing to be with you I am trying to learn typewriting from my husband we can build castles in the air maybe I can write it on my typewriter for him. You know, like the, the, like the distinction between the ways that she's, that she's characterizing herself in, in relation to these different characters feels like, feels really, like it feels, it feels meaningful. And I, and, and speaks, I think to like, to the strange ways that gender is being both presented and, and kind of policed by the characters who don't quite fit into like fit into the gender roles that they're supposed to fit into we are married I shall be able to you be useful to Jonathan woohoo and then you know Lucy writes back and says you won't believe who proposed to me it's all so exciting everything is so exciting everything's amazing everything's amazing um and then you know Mina does more boring stuff and it, it I find the letter exchange between those two um particularly particularly interesting. Um, and I also find it quite interesting that once, once Mina leaves, like, so, you know, halfway, halfway through the process of Lucy getting vamped, Mina 
gets the letter saying that Jonathan has been, you know, is in this convent. She's, you know, she's ready to marry him. She's going to go repress all sexuality by tying up the journal. Um, and they're going to, you know, they're going to live this happy life. At that moment, Lucy starts keeping her own diary. She says, you know, I must keep, you know, I must keep a diary in, or in imitation of Mina, I must, you know, I must start keeping a diary and recording all of the things that, that have happened. And that becomes one of the, the first real moments where, where, where Lucy starts trying to take control of her own story. We don't get very many diary entries from her. She gets, you know, like she gets killed pretty quickly afterwards, but Mina leaves and then, and then Lucy suddenly says to herself, I'm, I now have to, like, I have to take some control over this story because Mina, who has had quite a, quite a great deal of control over the story so far, is no longer here to, to do this. And the only people left are these menfolk who have no fucking clue what's going on and keep making really poor decisions about my health um, and thereby, like, give Dracula access to me because nobody is paying attention to anything because, like, what are you thinking? Like, if somebody is getting clearly molested in the night, like, why do you just let that happen it's all it's all madness anyway um we are <laughs> we're just about out of time so i'm wondering if anybody has any last comments you want to make or or anything that you want to make sure that we we talk about next time could we talk a little about dr seward next time because i think as i mentioned i had never really noticed him before but this read through i took a extreme dislike to him um, particularly in chapters 15 and 16, where he goes from being, having been in love with Lucy and not believing Dr. Van Helsing to positively in rejoicing in the destruction of the thing that she had become. Um, I, it made me really wonder about him as a narrator. Um, and I'd always kind of taken him a little up front as a man of science, pretty straightforward, kind of a little dull like Jonathan, not, you know, not a lot of passion there. Um, but it just struck me this read through how awful he is and the way he turns. I mean, he doesn't believe Van Helsing. He keeps pushing and doesn't believe him. And all of a sudden he's like, let's destroy this thing. And it also struck me that there is more detail in his description of Lucy's death than there is at any point of her condition. Yes, absolutely. I think that those are both those are both really important points. And yes, let's definitely talk about Seward because I also want to talk about Renfield and Seward's relationship to Renfield and how like weird it is speaking of the the medical ethics. Um but yeah, and and I feel like the you know the descriptions of Lucy's death are are again you know, related to related to Jonathan's ecstatic descriptions of um, you know, of being vamped. And also when we move later in the book, some things happened, some things happened to Mina that the, that the narrators, especially Dr. Seward, again, is like, they really, really love to, to describe these, you know, like they love to describe violence against women. They love to describe, you know, women being not the kind of women they're supposed to, like there, there is something, um, if toxic and, and, um, and and just worrying about like about the ways in which the men are describing what's happening to their to the women that they are supposed to be taking care of. So yeah, I think that those are really important points and we should definitely talk about them. Are there other things that folks want to make sure we talk about? I'd like to talk a little bit about different forms of knowledge and different ways that knowledge is passed from character to character in this book. Definitely. And that, you know, that even more in the, in the, in the come, second half, I think is really, is going to be really, really important. Like circulation of knowledge, like circulation of blood, like the things, the things that circulate and in which power resides, complicated and important. I would love to talk more about like the like Dracula's like non-Britishness like we talked about it a bit today but like his position especially with an English or a, a Irish man like writing this of like this isn't some like British villain this is like an other um kind of in like the orientalist way um and I find that really interesting yes absolutely uh, I, I'd also like to um talk about the possibility of Dracula doing good. In 
interesting. I look forward to hearing more about that. There's one passage I'm thinking of, but it's way near the end, so I'll wait. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about adaptations, Renee? Yes, we can definitely. We talk spend about some time at the end talking about different the different styles of ad adaptations, and you know, Hammer versus Universal versus fan fiction versus blah blah blah. That would be fun. Versus posters on the back of my on the <laughs> on the wall behind me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would love that, and I hope that that folks who have favorite favorite adaptations will um, will talk about them and, and bring them to bear on on the text at hand. I think it's incredible, you know, that uh, Coppola really got it. He has Lucy and, and Mina reading, um, you know, they're, they're reading the Kama Sutra. Kama Sutra. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, he, there's the, I, that's my favorite version, but anyway, I'll let, you know, we'll see what people think. I mean, it's 100% my favorite version too, like the campiness and the, just the, the making subtext text in that version, I think is just really beautifully done. <laughs> All right, folks, well, we are out of time, but I'm really excited to, to talk to you about the rest of this novel next week and to talk about all of these things you want to talk about and to, to see how it all turns out. <laughs> Thank you so much for your contributions and for, for all of your thoughts. It's been really fun.